Great. So uh, I'm tilting up the camera slightly. Ah, you want to tilt it up? Just a little bit higher. Hi, okay. That didn't quite work, but didn't I, can, work. I can see most people, yes. Great. Thank you. You're seeing a stuff. Okay, a <laughs> section. It, it, it works. Okay, excellent. Um, we are uh, delighted to have uh, as a speaker today, David Rolnick, who is joining us from uh, Montreal. David is a, a pro assistant professor at McGill, and he has also been really part of uh, Climate Change AI, one of the founders. And uh, he's going to talk to us today about ML and climate change and really looking forward to it. So David, it's all yours. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me just share my screen here. Hopefully you can all see this. Yeah. Okay, let me see if I can. Okay, it's at max right now. Okay. Hello, David. I, can you? We can't hear you. Oh, I I thought you were still adjusting things. No, that's all right. Yeah, go ahead. It's all good. Okay. Well, um, then let's start out. Um, I don't think the problem of climate change needs very much introduction for this audience. We're seeing increasingly um, its effects, more uh, more numerous and severe effects of climate change uh, as, as time moves forward. Um, everything from um, more frequent and severe storms to historic droughts to historic flooding, uh, heat waves, many, many other consequences. Um, and it's also important to bear in mind that climate change um, does not act equitably and serves to often reinforce existing inequities by having a disproportionate impact on already disadvantaged communities and geographies, and also often on communities and geographies that are least responsible for climate change. But climate change is not an on-off switch. How bad it gets depends on what we do now. Um, many people have already died as a result of climate change, and many more will die regardless of what we do now, but it can get extremely bad or really catastrophically bad, and we get to decide. Uh, so we need net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, according to the IPCC. Um, and even if that doesn't end up uh, being attained, we need to get as close to that as possible. So action encompasses both mitigation, which is reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and adaptation, which is resilience to the consequences of climate change, um, as well as climate science, which is understanding um, the climate and how it changes. Now, um, some of you might have already seen this, this paper that we put out with lots of um, applications of machine learning to, to climate change uh, relevant issues. Um, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, but use the framework that we presented there to dive into some specific applications within, within my own group, um, and also some, some broader themes for how one should think about these, these kinds of problems. Um, but I do want to say that if you are interested in applications of machine learning in any of these various different areas, from power systems to buildings and cities to agriculture, forestry, and other land use, uh, to transportation, uh, climate modeling, heavy industry, uh, different kinds of adaptation, I do encourage checking out that paper, which goes into a lot more detail. And I'll also have some resources at the end of the talk from Climate Change AI. So touching on some overall themes for how machine learning and AI can be relevant in, in climate action, there are a number of different levers that, that we see for, for why these two things are, are, are connected. Uh, first is improving operational efficiency. Um, there are many different examples, and again, I'm going to dive into examples of each of these in more detail in just a few moments. Um, but there are many complex automated systems where machine learning can be useful in helping control the system more efficiently. Where efficiently is is um, really depends on what you're what you're optimizing for. In in the cases that we care about here, it's probably energy efficiency or uh, directly reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But there are other situations where people use machine learning and AI to optimize stuff, right? And sometimes those are not actually aligned with with climate action. Sometimes they're they run they run counter to it. So, for example, if labor costs are higher than energy costs, then optimizing something for cost might mean actually increasing the energy and reducing the labor. Uh, and we do see this in certain cases. So it's worth it, 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 worth remembering that if you're improving efficiency, then your objective function really matters. 
Um, but some examples where it is pretty well aligned with climate action is uh, optimizing HVAC control, so heating and cooling systems and buildings to use less energy. Um, some of the difficult to decarbonize sectors like steel and cement manufacturing, which together are responsible for about 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and other, other areas in which we can really reduce energy consumption or, or directly uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, using better controllers and making the system more efficient. A second theme I want to touch on is gathering information. Um, so obviously there's a lot of a lot of data out there, but it's not necessarily always in the form that we want in order to make better decisions um, or, or guide climate action in, in certain certain ways. And so um, machine learning can be useful in gathering information, uh, for example, from satellite imagery or from big um, uh, bodies of, of text. So uh, you can use computer vision to parse satellite imagery to pick out information like um, uh, quantifying carbon stock in different in different parts of the world or estimating what communities are at risk from flooding, coastal inundation. Um, and then you could use natural language processing on large textual corpora, for example, to parse financial disclosures to pick out climate relevant information. So here we're taking some big unstructured data set and we're distilling it into some useful information that people can people can act on. Forecasting, so time series prediction, um, that has a lot of different, a lot of different uh, areas of relevance to, to, to climate action. Um, a couple I want to touch on here, uh, they're actually being used extensively within the, the UK's national grid, um, include uh, now casting for electricity supply, so understanding how much electricity is going to be produced, especially by, by wind and solar at particular moments in time. These are variable um, generation modes and they the, the amount of power produced varies from moment to moment. So in order to balance the electrical grid, you need to know how much is going to be produced. Um, and then also predicting demand. As I understand it, when National Grid uh, introduced the, 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 their new um, deep learning based um, demand uh, prediction system, it cut the error rate in half. Um, so that's just understanding how much power will need to be produced at any given point so that you can you can meet that demand and produce as, as little electricity as you need in order to meet the demand. Um, now, speeding up uh, simulations is another overall theme. Um, often asked if you could just have machine learning um, model the entire Earth's climate. And people are working on that in different contexts, but we do have very good models of the, of the climate, but sometimes they're very slow. And so particular pieces of them can be sped up. Often it's a particular piece rather than the entire thing using machine learning and AI because that can be faster than the uh, complex physical simulations. And same thing with things like grid planning models um, in, in power systems. And then final theme I want to touch on is accelerating scientific discovery. So taking um, the experimentation process and speeding it up, not by replacing experiments, but by doing as much as possible um, to, to suggest very, very good candidate experiments to try in the lab. So you don't have to do thousands and thousands of different trial runs. You can um, have a, an algorithm suggest, oh, this might be the one that you would want to do. Uh, based upon some some simulations and some um, so, so some machine learning predictions of what will perform well, that can be useful. For example, in design of of new materials for batteries, catalysts, perovskites uh, in solar cells, um, and a, a number of different applications. Okay, so these are some overarching themes. Um, I want to highlight that the, the interplay goes both ways. Um, there are opportunities not just for machine learning to be valuable in advancing climate action in, in certain cases, but also opportunities for uh, climate action to help spur innovation in, in important areas of machine learning. Um, and as machine learning often focuses on these very well-worn problems um, that you know, one gets incremental improvements on and are not necessarily relevant to actual applications in, in all cases. Um, there, there, there's really huge opportunity for expanding the set of motivating problems within machine learning so that people are working on things that are both more relevant and also where advances are, are more um, um, meaningful because the, 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 in expanding the diversity of challenges that we're attacking is really, is really um, useful in expanding the possibility of, of, of what we can do with algorithms. So some of the themes that I want to touch on here are hybrid physical models, so integrating machine learning methods with um, physics or other forms of constraints. Um, 
transfer learning and meta learning across different uh, data set domains. Uh, for example, if you're working across different geographic areas, or if the data is changing over time, for example, uh, due to non stationarity caused by climate change itself, you know, the weather and the climate, they change. So maybe you need to be able to adapt to different, different uh, climate regimes. Uh, interpretable and causal machine learning. Um, oftentimes, if you are working with a system that is making predictions that may be acted upon, then you need to have some idea of why the predictions are being made, or else nobody will want to actually act on them. Um, so having interpretability, ideally having causal explanations of what is linked to what, though that is very difficult. Um, and also having uncertainty quantification, so that if you have a prediction, you know how confident you are in that prediction, and it's well calibrated. And many more areas of, of cutting edge at all. However, I do want to say, simple methods are sometimes often sufficient. Many times in a relevant application, you can just use an existing machine learning method out of the box, or even not use a really a machine learning method at all, just some standard data processing technique. Um, and if you are using if you are using machine learning methods, definitely start out with the simpler, simplest ones. Random <laughs> forest is better than transformers if both are going to work. Uh, the simplest method is oftentimes most reliable, and it is certainly the one that is most likely to be used because it has the lowest entry barrier. So um, definitely start out with simple methods. What I do as a computer science researcher is like picking problems that we suspect will need innovation, but still trying the simplest baselines first because sometimes those work and that's great. Some key considerations overall. I don't think I need to say to this audience, but machine learning is not some silver bullet that's going to magically solve climate change. I wish. Um, it's only relevant sometimes in, in some particular areas. And even where it is relevant, it's only one piece of the puzzle. It needs to be integrated with all kinds of relevant domain knowledge and expertise from the, the relevant area of application. We'll get to you more in a moment. Um, the, the, the second point I want to touch on is that the, the applications of machine learning, the one hears about, say, in the news, are generally not the ones that are most impactful from a climate perspective. So, you know, I, what's in the news most now? Probably GPT. So chat GPT is probably not, not particularly relevant um, in, in making, making climate change better. Um, we'll get to energy consumption of massive, uh, massive machine learning models. Um, I'm not sure how relevant it is from that perspective either, but you know, certainly it's not, it's, 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 it's not how one should be thinking about, about having a, a positive climate impact. Um, Self-driving cars similarly get a lot of attention, probably actually making the climate a bit worse. Um, we'll get to both of those later on, um, but something like predictive maintenance, like finding failures in railroad tracks, super useful. Um, that is being used extensively now by, by Deutsche Bahn in, in Germany, and it doesn't get talked about that much, but it is a very, a very useful and actually interesting problem from a machine learning perspective. So th th think, think in those terms. And then a theme across everything really is interdisciplinary collaboration. So that has to be at every stage, scoping the right problems. Can't tell you how many times I see people working on a problem that's basically already been solved by non-computational methods or non-machine learning methods. And the people just don't realize that there is no need to solve this problem. Um, incorporating relevant domain information because if you are not using that information, you're tying one arm behind your back. And the theme for a lot of what I'm going to be talking about in the rest of this talk and research from my own group is you know, different ways of incorporating domain information by working with people from the relevant from the relevant community. And then shaping pathways to impact. And you need to think about that right from the start, actually, because unless you're thinking about how somebody is going to use the system, then you are you, you don't know if you if you have to build in some constraint or um, um, some some functionality that will greatly change what you're actually building. And so we'll see that actually in the first example, where because of a particular kind of failure mode, you really need to avoid. This means that you're actually designing a totally different algorithm. So thinking about the pathways to impact right from the start. And then I also want to touch on equity considerations. There are a lot of ways in which machine learning in um, in, in the context of climate change uh, it intersects with climate equity and climate justice considerations. And a few of these are obviously empowering diverse stakeholders, ensuring that the people who are able to work on these problems um, are represent a, 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 a wide diversity of geographies, institutions, uh, fields, um, 
and, and more. And um, this can intersect also with notions of digital divide and whether certain um, institutions have privileged access to large amounts of computational resources, for example. There are reasons why, um, why AI research can be particularly uh, ex exclusionary towards, uh, towards um, certain communities. Um, selecting and prioritizing problems. Implicitly, many of the problems that get prioritized in the field reflect certain kinds of biases. Uh, so, for example, I hear a lot about discussion of machine learning with, with um, wildfires, and that's great. It's a problem we should be working on, and there are various ways in which machine learning is relevant to, to uh, predicting or fighting wildfires, though I'm not going to get into them today. Um, but I don't hear as much about fighting uh, melting glaciers or uh, locust outbreaks, which are both also problems that are exacerbated by climate change. It's just that wildfires <laughs> primarily affect um, uh, North America, um, Europe, Australia, and uh, locusts primarily affect the Middle East, East Africa, South Asia, um, et cetera. So thinking about what problems are implicitly getting prioritized and really just making sure everyone's working on a lot of different problems. Uh, with people who are relevant to studying those problems. So it intersects at the first point. And then ensuring that data is representative, because oftentimes one ends up in a situation where uh, the data is coming from places that um, maybe reflect geographic biases or community biases, you know, even within a single geography, maybe the data is, is all coming from more well-resourced communities. Um, so that means that the algorithm that you end up with uh, is going to be potentially um, uh, um, only effective in, in those in those uh, particular communities or geographies uh, or not adapt well. Um, conversely, you could end up with data colonialism where data is being sort of gathered unscrupulously from certain geographies or communities because there are fewer restrictions without actually benefiting those communities. And so you can end up in both of these different regimes. Um, uh, there are huge issues there to this be discussed, but there isn't. That's a bit outside the, the scope of what I have time for right now. Okay, so let's dive into some examples here. Um, uh, first, I want to touch on improving operational efficiency. Um, so the, the example I want to I want to give here is um, our work on constrained deep learning for grid optimization, and the motivation here is that one wants to balance the electric grid. So that's a challenge for, for grid operators. And in order to do that, one needs to solve a non-convex optimization problem, which is called AC optimal power flow. This is what it looks like. It is a quadratic um, program, but it's, no, it's, it's not convex. It's, it's a non-convex quadratic. Um, uh, both the objective function and the constraints are quadratic. And since it is a non-convex uh, problem, exact solutions take too long. Uh, so typically what, what a grid operators do is they simplify the problem, um, linearizing it and wasting large amounts of power in the process because you get a suboptimal solution, um, which means that you are um, essentially producing more power than you need to. Um, a, a little bit more complicated than that. Um, and this is especially a problem with solar and wind generation because um, you need to solve this more frequently with, with variable generation since the constraints of the problem, the amount of power available is changing over time. And so the more times you solve the problem sort of compounds the issue. Now, typical deep learning, which you might imagine is like, oh, maybe we can use a deep learning algorithm just to solve this, solve this approximately instead of going through our non-convex solver, which is really slow. So typical deep learning actually fails here. You're trying to optimize this subject to the constraints. Sort of the naive way that you would do it is by saying, oh, well, you try to optimize this thing, but don't deviate from these constraints too much. And that's, that's what's called a soft penalty for constraint violation. But this is actually useless. And the reason is because if you violate any of these constraints, the grid could go down and nobody would ever want to use an algorithm where that's the case. So you can't have constraint violation at all. You can't trade off between your objective function and constraint violation. Say, I'm just going to violate this constraint a little bit. It's just going to be slightly breaking the physics of how power go works in a grid. No, you can't slightly break physics. So um, we want to avoid blackouts. And so we design a deep learning approach um, that approximately solves non-convex optimization problems, but importantly, while satisfying hard constraints. And this is work code led with uh, Priya Dompi. Um, so let me discuss how it works. What we're doing here is we are taking an approximate mapping from some inputs to some outputs, um, where the, the inputs are the parameters of the optimization problem. 
So you've got a family of optimization problems here where it might, the X might be like the demand for power or the, the, um, the amount of power available. So like there, there are a bunch of different things captured by X. Um, and you want to uh, take the parameters of your particular instance and find the optimum really fast. So the optimum is this, this Y that minimizes the objective function subject to the constraints, where both the objective function and the constraints are parameterized by X. So what do we what do we do here? We're going to train this big end-to-end -end deep learning uh, architecture. And there's a neural network here, which is the, the, sort of the, 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 um, the obvious part. And that's taking in X and it's throwing out the outputs. But it's actually not throwing out all of the outputs. So let's look at this first piece. We're outputting a subset of the variables, and that's because we have equality constraints. And with the equality constraints, we can solve for the remaining ones. So we output only as many variables as we need to determine the entire solution. And so that's that's basically knowing that if you have a certain number of equality constraints, then you can solve for that number of additional variables. So you sort of subtract m if you've got um, if you've got m equations here. Then you um, you complete these remaining variables. How do you do that? Well, there are different ways, but um, we will actually typically do this via um, uh, a numerical method, like Newton's method, that allows you to find the solution to a set of of, uh, of equalities. Now, you, those who have worked with with like end-to-end -end training of deep learning systems will notice that this is a problem naively because. Newton's method is is um, an implicit solver. It's not giving you a closed form answer that you can differentiate through. But there's a trick that we can do to get around that, which is to use the implicit function theorem. And so if we're trying to work out the derivatives of these variables with respect to these variables, we can do it implicitly, even if we use Newton's method to get them, because we have the set of constraints. And so we can get the derivatives we need just by using the implicit function theorem on these constraints. Happy to talk about that more if people have questions. Okay, so the next step that we do is we need to, we've satisfied the equality constraints sort of by definition because we solved them to get the remaining variables. And now the, those are the hardest things to do. So we've, we've done the hardest part in some sense. We need to solve the inequality constraints too. And so how do we do that? Well, we actually just use gradient descent on the output. This is not gradient descent on the function. This is gradient descent on the output. So you, we push the output of the function towards satisfying the inequality constraints. And in practice, it only takes a few steps. Um, so we push, we, we, we're staying on the, the, the green manifold here, which is everything that satisfies the equality constraints, and we're pushing it towards the blue subset, which is what satisfies the inequality constraints in addition to the equality constraints. Okay. And then we just train the entire thing end to end <coughs> using the loss. The loss is just the objective function that we're trying to minimize. And then we also say, don't deviate too much from the equality, some from the inequality or the equality constraints. That's just to help it learn its little optimization trick. Okay. Um, again, we are throwing our inputs, which are parameters of an optimization problem, into a neural network, outputting some partial set of solution variables, completing it to a full set, correcting that so it satisfies the inequality as well as the equality constraints, and then training the whole thing end to end. We tested this in a bunch of different contexts, um, convex quadratic programs, which are solvable by traditional methods. If you make it, if you take the, the convex quadratic program and make it non-convex just by like turning the linear term into a sign term, this immediately breaks all of the standard uh, solutions. But our method works just as well, um, and it, it solves that effectively. But then the, the problem that we're really interested in is AC optimal power flow, um, which motivated the whole thing. And so we can see um, this is the neural network trained with just a soft loss sort of naive, naive approach of like let's trade off between optimizing and violating the constraints. Let's not violate the constraints too much, but we see that's not good enough. You violate the constraints, the equality constraints, are the harder ones. You violate the constraints uh, a, a lot more than, than you would wish. Um, this is if you were doing supervised learning, if you had a bunch of term uh, of, of data points that you were learning from, you were saying, oh, I'll match these patterns. So you're not trying to optimize the objective function at all. You're just trying to um, do what, um, uh, what happened in the past and learn from that. And that violates the constraints as well, even if you include our, our sort of gradient descent to correct for, for, for um, violating inequalities. And then for the um, these various ablations of our method, which I won't really go into, which just negate different parts of the method. The thing I want to really touch on is our, our method, which is in blue, 
uh, compared to the classical optimizer at the top. And you can see that our method is sort of naively even 10 times faster, basically the same objective value and doesn't violate any of the constraints. Um, it's actually more than 10 times faster than the classic optimizer because this was assuming no parallelization, but deep learning is actually even much easier to parallelize. So you might imagine it would be like 100 times faster in a real application. Okay, so let's go into another uh, example, and this will touch on both of these themes of gathering information uh, from some big unstructured data set, and then also forecasting. And this is a sort of general purpose technique that we're using in several different contexts. We're actually also using it now in the first context um, in optimizing HVAC systems, but I won't get into that. So the, the motivation I want to I wanna bring up uh, here is, is remote sensing for agriculture. Though again, the method that we develop is going to be broadly useful. Um, indeed, actually, I didn't mention this. The last method is also broadly useful. Like non-convex optimization problems with hard constraints turn up in a lot of different contexts, and we're working on using that method in other kinds of contexts. But anyway, so remote sensing for agriculture. Um, obviously, agriculture is intimately linked to climate change, both from a mitigation and an adaptation perspective. And in this case, we're looking at an adaptation application. So mapping crops and forecasting yield, which are essential to averting food insecurity as climate change is influencing weather and climate patterns that, that influence in turn uh, crop yield. So we would like to have um, an ability to map crops and forecast yield. And machine learning is a really good tool for that, except that we don't have very much data in many locations and for many crops. So this is a data from our partners at NASA. Um, this is called the crop harvest data set. And blue and orange are data points. And so there's a lot of blue. It doesn't cover everywhere, but the really useful data is the orange data, which has labels not just of is it a crop or not, which is what blue means, but is it a particular kind of crop? And we'd really like that information. Um, but it, again, it's very sparse across the world, and it's also imbalanced across different locations and different crops. And so how do we develop a machine learning algorithm given all of this? Well, what we would like to do is we'd like to be able to generalize fast to new locations with relatively minimal data. And this is what we do. We develop meta-learning algorithms. If you haven't seen meta-learning, I'll get into a review of it on the next slide. Uh, we develop meta-learning algorithms for remote sensing that can label crops and predict yield uh, generalizing fast to new locations. So they don't need too much new data in a new place or a new crop in order to learn that. Uh, and this is work led by my student, Gabby Tsai. Now, uh, background on meta-learning. Meta-learning, also called learning to learn, it refers to learning in such a way that the model can quickly adapt to a new task given some new data. And the textbook, cl classical, you know, classic, um, algorithm that people often use for, for meta-learning is MAML, um, which specifically optimizes for learning on new tasks. It's a little bit hard to wrap one's head around, but you're basically taking a neural network. It doesn't say what the neural network is, but it's like a framework for training neural networks. So you, you take the parameters of your neural network, theta, and you're optimizing them by gradient descent, right? And that's just normal deep learning. But you're optimizing with a loss that says, okay, well, your loss is such that if you take a new gradient update with new data, you want to be really close to, you want to, you want to get to be able to get to all of these new um, parameter settings that are good for different tasks. So if I, if I were to be in this place and I were to update using data from task two, then I would go here. And that would be a good setting of the parameters for task two. If I already use data from task three, I would end up in a good setting of the parameters for task three. And I would, if I use data from task one, I would end up in a good setting of the parameters for task one. So it's basically saying, go in this direction because this direction puts you close to optima for all these different tasks. Whereas these other directions don't enable you to adapt as fast. And so you're optimizing for adapting fast. This can run across different neural network architectures and different tasks. Uh, it's pretty agnostic as to that. And we're going to come up with a task-informed version of meta-learning that can build on top of MAML or actually other, other methods as well. So task-informed meta-learning can be added to a meta-learning framework. And it has two components. And the main component is a learned task encoder. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to, so again, a theme overall is incorporating knowledge of the relevant domain, like what needs to be done there, what we have access to. And in the case of agricultural data, and actually a lot of other 
meta learning um, frame, meta learning tasks you might be interested in. There's data that hasn't been used, and that's what is the nature of the task in geographic remote sensing. That includes lat long. In our case, it also includes crop type. And so we're going to throw that metadata, say, oh, what crop are you looking for? And where are you in the world? You always have access to that information. Um, this is sorry, desired crop type. It's, you don't, it's not like looking at the data, but it's like, what, what are you looking for? Are you looking for, looking for corn? Are you looking for, um, uh, for soybeans? Are you looking for, for uh, almonds? And so it takes this task metadata and it modulates the hidden representations in the meta learner using that metadata. So take this task encoder and it learns embeddings that then just modulate, like this, this is just a simple, a simple affine transformation, just multiplies by this, this, this embedding vector and adds this other embedding vector. And it does that for the hidden layers in the meta learning uh, model. So two neural networks, one task encoder, one the standard meta learner. And that is enabling the meta learner to sort of take into account where in the world it is, which is really useful. The second component that we introduce is forgetfulness. And that's just because you have really imbalanced data. So you want to throw out data where the model is already, has already learned it and you don't want it to overfit too much. So tasks that the model has already memorized are dropped from training dynamically to enhance generalization. So what do we find? We're looking at a bunch of different agricultural tasks. This is crop type classification. And we find that we kind of blow all the other methods out of the water, including classical mammal, but also, um, also uh, if you just use a pre-training method where you just pre-trained on a bunch of data and then you try to train on your new data without doing meta-learning specifically, it is much better than that. It's much better than not pre-training at all. And it's much better than just a random forest um, approach. So the, a, 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 a simple classical baseline. You can break it down by these individual tasks, which I don't really have time to do, but in particular, we're notably better in Brazil. And th th this Brazil task, one of the reasons why we're so much better, you can see like the, the TIML task informed meta learning algorithm is so much better than all these things. That's because there's basically no data there. It's a very, very small data set. And we can see that the effective training set size is really dramatic. In Kenya and Togo, there's actually a bit more data. So we, we tried cutting down the data and seeing how well our model performed. And you can see all these other models are really dropping in performance as soon as you get to really small data sets because it doesn't have the, the, the task metadata to, to start out learning from. And even if you have no data at all, we can actually perform pretty well. So zero shot learning because you have this task metadata. You Maybe you've seen coffee in Kenya and maize in Brazil, but you've never seen coffee in Brazil. Well, if you know what the crop type is and what the geography is, you can use that in order to inform your learning, even if you've never seen that particular combination before. Um, we also are able to perform well on, on this uh, regression task, not classification. This is crop yield prediction, where um, re regardless of the architecture, even if you're, using a, if you're using a CNN, if you're using an LSTM, you're still going to get a benefit by using, um, by using task informed meta learning. Okay, that's the second application. I want to touch on one more from these overall themes, speeding up simulations. So the motivation here is that there are many pieces of, of climate models. Radiative transfer is one of them. It basically just means how radiation passes through or is absorbed by layers in the atmosphere. Um, so radiation goes through, some of it gets reflected by the atmosphere, some of it gets absorbed by the ground, some of it then is, is, is re-emitted from, from the ground and absorbed by or passes through the atmosphere. And this is very important in, in climate change, not surprisingly. But it's time intensive to compute with exact physics. And one of the reasons these bottlenecks are important, it means that climate models have to be run at higher resolution, not just because of radiative transfer, but because of many of these computational bottlenecks. You end up with models that take months to run, even on supercomputers. And that means that they have to be run at really coarse spatial resolution, which can make local and regional responses to climate change hard. And it has various other consequences as well. So we'd like to be able to speed up these pieces of, of the simulation. And we use deep learning to rapidly approximate radiative transfer calculations. Um, so this is work um, led by my students, uh, Zafahul Linkachai and Venkatesh Ramesh. And um, we introduce actually an entire data set in addition to models that, that perform well on it. So we take data from the Canadian Earth System model, 
um, including notably out of distribution test sets, which I, I mentioned that you know since the climate is changing, the data is changing. So we account for that. We include some data from before industrial times um, in, um, the, uh, that uh, indicate the um, you know concentrations of greenhouse gases, which are very different from those now. Also, future conditions simulated. Um, where there are more greenhouse gases, and then a, a weird anomaly of volcanic eruption, the eruption of Mount Pinatubo, which um, changed the concentration of that, uh, gases in the atmosphere uh, for, for like a year, 1991. Um, and then we are inputting these various different things. This is what our model has to predict from, and it's predicting the up and down welling flux, short and long wave, and heating rates per layer in like a, a column of atmosphere. So you've got this like 1D column of atmosphere that has different layers and you're trying to predict the properties of, of energy exchange basically between the different layers. So we use fully connected networks, one-dimensional CNNs, because remember this is a 1D column of atmosphere, various graph networks that can capture connectivity between the different levels and layers of the atmosphere, and then also transformers as like a, a cool new thing. Um, we find that continents and graph nets do really well, and they, they, they generalize better than the fully connected networks, not surprisingly maybe because they're incorporating the structure of the, um, of the data, like that it's structured spatially in this particular way. Um, and so actually all the models perform really well on the data that they were trained on, but in terms of generalization to new data, things like the, the CNN are going to perform very well because they incorporate that, that structure. I don't really have time to talk about more of this. We're also incorporating physics-based loss functions um, to help train these models um, and, and have them work in different conditions, like um, the, the, the uh, cloudy conditions are actually more challenging than the clear sky conditions, not surprisingly. But they're, they're performing very well and they're actually currently being um, uh, integrated into the, the Canadian global climate models. So, I am not, I'm not going to have time to touch on this last point, which is accelerating scientific discovery. We do work on that in my group as, as well, actually. We've, we've been working um, a lot on the Open Catalyst uh, data set, which is trying to discover, um, we're trying to model uh, that we're also working to discover new effective catalysts for um, uh, low carbon energy uh, storage. Um, but um, I don't have time to talk about the electrocatalyst work, unfortunately. Um, I do want to touch on one more project, though, and this is sort of a meta level, a meta level project where we we, we analyzed really the effect of what happens when you don't bring cross disciplinary expertise to the table. So machine learning continues, as I, as I mentioned before, to rely on a lot of benchmark data sets, things like ImageNet which this particular, several versions of ImageNet, this one alone has 32,000 citations. So it's very, very popular. And machine learning practitioners often rely on such benchmark data sets to evaluate models. So work out how good they are um, and uh, compare lots of different models. And maybe like a tiny improvement in accuracy is, is really fantastic on ImageNet because so many people have worked on it. But then also to pre-train for real-world tasks. So take this data, train a model on this data, and then adapt it to some new data where maybe you don't have very much new data. So that's why pre-training is really useful. Now, these data sets have a lot of problems. Um, they're often created from internet data, chosen and annotated by computer scientists or by members of the public without relevant experts in the room. Um, so in the case of in the case of ImageNet, this was just a, a, an image search online. So you, you know, if you are trying to find images of dog, you take a, take a Google search for dog, basically get a lot of images and then annotate them. You check them, but you check them with with people from Amazon Mechanical Turk. That was how it was done, and those are not experts in the relevant areas, generally speaking. And what we're going to look at is the part of ImageNet which is made up of. Of, of images of wild animals, which is actually 27% of the entire data set. And what happens when you get a bunch of computer scientists in a room, tell them to pick animals, and then search for those animals, images of them, and then annotate them by just members of the public? It doesn't, it doesn't work out well. We work with some ecologists, experts in lots of different taxa, um, to animal, uh, analyze these images. So we you know, analyze the primate images with, with primatologists. We analyze the, the fish images with ichthyologists, et cetera. And this is work with Sasha Luchoni. 
Um, so the um, first thing I want to touch on is we, we find a lot of errors. This is maybe the, 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 the most obvious thing that one could find. We find that 12% of the images are just flat out wrong. Some classes, some, some categories of images are 90% wrong. Um, like, for example, the, the rock crab, where 96% of the images are incorrect. Not good. And there's a, a, a difference between different uh, taxonomic groups. So amphibians and reptiles are particularly likely to be incorrectly identified. Even birds, which are the lowest, are still over 5%. Now, there are many reasons. You can have annotator inexperience. Uh, so, for example, uh, herons versus cranes, these are similar groups of birds, and there are images in the data set that are labeled as um, herons and are actually, uh, sorry, the labeled the, the, the labels as cranes, but are actually herons, the labels as one species of heron, but are actually another species of heron, even though both species of heron are classes in the data set. So these are like, the, these are mislabeled images, which are actually, they should be another class in the data set. And then there's also nomenclature reasons why, you know, maybe the, the, the different uh, kinds of animals don't look similar, but there's a name which, it, which is really misleading. So leaf beetle, for example, is a term that refers to beetles in a particular family, Chrysomelody. But um, when you do a Google search for leaf beetle, you get a lot of images of just beetles on leaves. And so there is a large fraction, I think about 50% of the images of leaf beetle are actually other kinds of beetle on leaves, even though there are other beetle classes in ImageNet. So there's a lot of overlap between these classes like ladybugs. Ladybugs on leaves could get put in leaf beetle or they could get put in ladybug. So it's just really a mess. Then there are also 12% of classes that conflict with other classes like Tusker is a sort of vernacular, non-scientific word for an elephant with long tusks. But there's another category, which is African elephant. And so these basically overlap completely. Meerkat is a kind of mongoose. And many of the images of, in the mongoose category are actually meerkats. And all of the images in the meerkat category are mongooses. Um, and then a number of the classes are vague or unclear, like cricket or kite, which depend upon basically where in the world you are. And that leads us to our next point, which is geographic bias. So we analyze where the images come from. This is one of the things that I find particularly exciting about this kind of analysis. If you're looking at a chair, you don't know where in the world it's from necessarily just by looking at it. But if it's a bird, you can know where it is found in the world. And we find, we identify the birds to species um, by, by working with, with um, expert ornithologists. And we find that 58% of the images show birds from the US, even though the US is only 8% of bird diversity. And Europe is also overrepresented. So I'm not gonna go into all these different pieces, but we find that the imbalance is true for a bunch of different reasons. The choice of classes. So for example, there's only one kind of eagle in the data set, and it's the bald eagle, which is the national bird of the US. There are like a dozen countries that have national birds that are eagles, but only the US is the one that, that got picked. Mislabeled images, like um, there's a class which is supposed to be the European goldfinch, and it's actually all pictures of the American goldfinch. Um, and then there are these non-specific classes, which is J. And you probably uh, recognize this one, which is the one that's just found in Europe. But 62% of the images for J are this one, which is the blue J found in the US and Canada. And I don't think there are any pictures of these which are found in Mexico. There's a green jay and the Sichuan jay found in China. And there are 50 species of jays in the world. And if you show basically all of the pictures as this one, then it's really, really misrepresentative, even though it's technically correct. Uh, some other problems, contextual bias. Uh, a lot of images of fish that look like this, person with fish that they've caught. Um, same thing with game species like antelopes with people having shot them. And 62% of these particular kinds of fish are actually pictures of people fishing the fish. 5% um, of the images are multiple kinds of animal. Uh, is this a zebra or a cow? 1% hmm? are fake animals, like this really cute stuffed dugong. And 1% are image collages, where in this case, the only one that's correct is this one. All the others are incorrect, and they actually fall mostly into other ImageNet classes. Lots of problems. 
Why does this matter? So first of all, sort of specifically the relevance to ImageNet, accuracy is not an effective metric, just ImageNet is, is a problem from so many perspectives. Uh, I'm not gonna talk into all the ways in which, uh, for example, uh, misogyny is manifest uh, in, in the data set, but um, this is a, a new reason why ImageNet is just manifestly uh, inaccurate and problematic. Also, it's secretly testing few and zero shot learning because there are these really imbalanced classes like blue J is actually mostly blue J's, but then there are a few of these other things. So it's it's not purporting, it's not testing what it purports to test. And then there are dangers using ImageNet data to develop real world tasks. People use ImageNet data, particularly in low resourced uh, communities or, 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 or low resourced institutions to develop new algorithms, including for wildlife classification. And we don't know what effect that's having. Because you know, if you're just using this really, really biased data set, an inaccurate data set, who knows what effect it will have. But then more broadly, and the reason I want to bring it up is because it points to broader failures in machine learning, in creation of data sets, in creation of algorithms, where oftentimes the problems and the algorithms are being designed by a very small subset of people with a very small subset of the expertise. And when that clashes with an application that purports to be about biodiversity, that is a, a significant problem. And so you end up with, um, things like this, which is a real image from ImageNet, which is a wombat in a uh, in a dress with human hands and butterfly wings. It's a particularly egregious example. So systemic change is needed in uh, machine learning best practices for data set creation and use, and also for algorithm creation and use, because you need domain expertise there too. So I wanna close by talking about how machine learning can actually also negatively impact the climate. There are a bunch of different ways that this happens. The thing that gets talked about the most probably is computation. So energy from uh, running algorithms and the embodied emissions from hardware. So, you know, there's carbon costs from creating a computer. And this is important, particularly for really large language models, which are just use a lot of computation. But in some sense, this is only the tip of the iceberg because there are other things too. Machine learning has, generally speaking, a much bigger impact, good or bad, through what it's doing. And what it's doing is not always good. Machine learning is used extensively by the oil and gas industry to accelerate exploration and extraction. It's estimated that about, 20, uh, about half a trillion dollars of additional profit will be made by the oil and gas industry thanks to AI and advanced analytics just by 2025. And there are many other ways in which machine learning is being used to accelerate carbon intensive sectors and carbon intensive activities. And then potentially even uh, and even potentially even bigger than this are the systemic impacts of applications. Uh, uh, systemic impacts like changes in human behavior. Some of these can be good, but there are a lot which are bad. Notably, I want to point at advertising systems. Most of the, uh, of the advertising systems, like online advertising, it's all driven by machine learning. And that's specifically designed to increase consumption. So a lot of machine learning energy is being like energy in the sense of like human capital, human atten attention in machine learning is being di directed at these problems, which are probably significantly increasing climate change. And again, probably much more than you know, how the algorithm is being done is what the algorithm is being used to do. Both of these need to be thought about. And then there are a bunch of situations where we really have it in our in our power to change how the impact of the algorithm is going to is going to be. So autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars, depends on whether we are using them for self-driving personal cars or self-driving buses, trucks. If we are using, if we are developing autonomous public transportation, that could be beneficial for climate change. But it's expected that if we focus, as the industry is currently, on algorithms for self-driving personal cars, then it, it, that's going to probably make climate change worse because it's going to lead to people driving more. It's so lowering the barrier to people driving. So really how we're designing a technology makes a huge difference. And I, I want to I end here by, 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 by leaving you with the idea that you know, people talk about AI for good, but that really shouldn't mean just like add some new applications of, of AI on top of business as usual. It should mean thinking about the applications that we're doing now, maybe think about the computation, 
um, you know, computation is probably the thing that you think about if you're not working on something that's relevant to climate change. So if it's good for the climate, you don't have to really worry about the computation. If it's bad for the climate, it's probably like if the application is bad, that's probably by, by, by far the biggest factor. Um, maybe you think about computation if you're working on something that's kind of neutral from a climate perspective, neutral from, from other impacts perspective. Um, and then, you know, there are all of these applications of machine learning that are implicitly being valued by the community because a lot of, a lot of people end up working on algorithms that end up becoming advertising systems, for example. Um, but those need to be shaped as well because we can't just cherry pick the good uses of, of, of machine learning and AI. Um, I'll leave you with a slide about climate change AI, which um, as noted at the start is, uh, it's a nonprofit organization that catalyzes impactful work at the intersection of climate change and AI. A lot of resources, including that big paper on tackling climate change with machine learning that we put out. Um, aimed at different audiences. So if you're interested in policy, we have also a, a, a long 100-page report for policymakers on, on shaping the space. We have a lot of events. So an upcoming workshop is at iClear uh, 2023 uh, in Kigali, Rwanda. Um, so that'll be in May. Um, you can still submit to that workshop. It, the deadline is in like a week or two. Um, so check that out if you're interested. Um, you can also look at past um, uh, past submissions here, which is uh, climatechange.ai slash papers. Um, and then the applications for our summer school are still open for another week or so. No, a few days, like in four days. Take, take a look at it now if you're interested. It's open for, for uh, grad students. It's open for postdocs and people outside of academia. Um, and it has climate tracks and a climate, tra a, a climate track and an AI track. Um, the um, summer school has both a, you can do it in person or you can just have a virtual component. So check out both options on our website. And then we also have innovation grants, um, which I think the deadline is also still not passed for. So you can submit to our workshop or uh, apply to our summer school or apply for an innovation grant, which is 150,000 typically uh, US dollars for a year long project at this intersection. And then we have a newsletter with lots of news, uh, like calls for submissions, latest papers, data sets, uh, jobs, and uh, a lot of events for the community, like webinars and happy hours. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions, um, and I, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. OK, questions from here, I believe we are. Go ahead. Uh, I think uh, I heard some people talk that compared to computational biology or medical imaging, many problems in climate change are less well formulated or structured, so it's more difficult to start with machine learning. I, I wonder what's your thoughts on this, how to better scope the problems for, for this field? It depends on the problem. area. Climate change is not one area, so like power systems, it tends to be a little bit more developed. Uh, same thing with climate science it tends to be a little bit more developed in intersection with data science and, and machine learning, but it's still it's there's still a lot more progress that needs to to happen. But yeah, I think the the, the definitely certain problems and, and data sets and benchmarks haven't been framed as well. But that's an opportunity because the, there's a lot of low hanging fruit here. Um, and if one becomes especially an expert in bridging different communities, that can be very very valuable because these bridges haven't been fully developed yet in a way that they have been a bit better developed in healthcare, just simply because people have been working on machine learning in healthcare for longer. Anybody else? Um, yeah. So really interesting talk. Um, I just had a question um, on the ag area that you focused on as, a, as, a, as an example, looking at crops yeah. and whether this question of bias and difficulty of identification is also the case when we're not looking at monoculture, when we're looking at agriculture that is- um, um, Oh gosh, yes, so true. And it's also perhaps oh, yeah. local community or indigenous based. I, it's so true. And I mean, even the way I framed it was sort of assuming no intercropping. This is like, is it this crop or is it this crop? Well, what if it's both crops? Absolutely, totally true. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, it, it's I, 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 the, the, yes, it's something that's on that's on people's radar um, because it is something that turns up a lot, um, especially in certain geographies, especially in certain communities. Um, but it's definitely a problem. There's a question in the chat for power systems, especially to what extent have uh, has one been able to integrate uh, one's work into real power systems? How do you approach bridging those connections? You know, absolutely, um, huge challenge. 
Um, so there is interest in from from power grid operators in looking at these kinds of algorithms, but it, 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 different. For, I, I sort of gave a particularly challenging example because this is a grid operation algorithm, and you need you need pretty significant buy-in to get grid operation algorithms to change. It's not something that can change at like really the micro level, though though, though it is potentially amenable to micro grid applications as well. Um, we have talked with with grid operators about this, and there is interest. And it's also just moving the needle on pe th people think that they can't use deep learning for certain things, whereas actually they should be able to just do it really carefully and with certain kinds of uh, safeguards built in. Um, so there are other applications in power systems which are sort of more less high stakes, right? Where, where if, if the thing fails, maybe it's like a prediction maintenance algorithm that you know, people are very amenable to that kind of thing. But also power grid uh, uh, algorithms have been developed. So I mentioned national grid has, has integrated both uh, supply and demand forecasting into, into the grid. So, okay. Um, Amelia has a question on, on the chat table. And yes, and yes, we did have baselines uh, where the other networks were given access to lat long information. It just wasn't incorporated into the meta learner in precisely this way. And if you don't incorporate it in this in this intelligent way, then it just doesn't work. So let me try and end with a question, a comment, and a question. So the comment is that uh, you know the energy and environment group here in computer science is, uh, does have partnerships with the planet science people at the British Antarctic Institute, and also through. The uh, Cambridge Conservation Initiative with biodiversity and uh, various remote sensing groups. So this is uh, something that we do take very seriously at Cambridge. And so if you are in this neighborhood, do come and visit. We'd like to have you here. So that's the comment. And, oh, uh, yeah. So I actually, I actually will be in the UK um, in uh, a few months for a workshop specifically on our work in um, identifying Lepidoptera. So field okay. traps for for identifying um, moths at scale wow. using machine learning algorithms. Um, okay. there, so, so yes, uh, definitely, definitely uh, already talking with 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 um, uh, our, our collaborators in the UK on biodiversity issues and very very interested. So because is this Lynn Dix by any chance? I'm sorry. Is it Professor Lynn Dix? Um, this is UK Center for for Ecology and Hydrology. Okay. Uh, okay, but I'm uh, very delighted, delighted to know you're coming here. So certainly would like to meet you. I'm sure many other people would as well. Fantastic. The question I have uh, and is that, you know, you showed us examples of work from a very broad diversity of topics, ranging from bias and data sets to, you know, uh, bar grid uh, and agriculture. What approach do you take in your group to decide what problem to work on? Because as you said, there's lots of low-hanging fruits of what yeah. to work on. So all of these problems that we're that we're looking at really come down to how do we integrate domain information in different ways to improve generalization in machine learning algorithms, and that's an overall theme that informs a lot of our our, our, our choices of problems. But also it, it depends on the stakeholders that one can work with. So you know we are picking problems partly based upon feeling that there are concrete pathways to impact. And sometimes that is about having the right collaborators. So in the case of agriculture, I didn't really talk about it, but we're collaborating with NASA Harvest, which explicitly works with different governments in order to inform their agricultural policy. So for example, the government of Togo reached out to NASA Harvest and said, hey, we need machine learning to work out where to divert our agricultural aid. And so NASA Harvest works with governments like the Togolese government. And that's why our algorithms are you know, particularly valuable because they can do directly use in these kinds of contexts. Great. Thank you very much. Let's thank David once more. Thank you so much for having me. And that brings us to the end of the seminar. Thank you so much, David. We look forward to seeing you in person. Look forward to seeing you. Thank you. I'm <laughs> <laughs>